In this video, I'm going to show you how to fix somewhat of a common problem. And this here is a T480, but this is a problem that's been going on with the T440s all the way up to the T480s's and stuff like that. And even other models like X1s and so forth. But pretty much what happens is, and you can see there, I got no display, nothing plugged in, but I do got the HDMI plugged in and at least RAM and everything else in there. And there is definitely RAM in, well, not this one, but I got it in this slot right here. You can see there's memory in there. I got the CMOS battery. We'll go ahead and power it on. I'll show you what it does. So go ahead here. We're going to push the power button. And yep, you can see this. And then there's the infamous uh, memory sound of death, essentially. And you can see the fan did spin up and stuff. So that tells me right off the back that the um, CPU rails actually all came up and stuff like that. So all the phase rails are powered up and so, so CPU is working but something's wrong between the communication of the RAM and the CPU and stuff and it's not the CPU I'll tell you exactly what it is and I'll go ahead and just demonstrate that actually so we'll go and turn it off I'm just gonna do something pretty simple okay we'll go ahead and power this back up again and of course it's got it plugged into the HDMI so we can see if we get video or a picture so let's go and power it up and it's not a bad trackpad either <laughs> just to let you know you can see there no more beep and you can see there it is posting now why did it do that why does all of a sudden now the CPU sees the memory and stuff like that and it's good and why did disconnecting the trackpad actually have anything to do with that issue altogether and stuff well if you look at the schematic it took me a while to figure this out many years ago you'll see that the actual memory and the trackpad and the on track point for the also keyboard and all that other stuff share the same sm bus and essentially there's a switch there and that switch itself is actually what goes bad so by me disconnecting that trackpad and track point now it's able to communicate with the memory no problem and you'll see where the traces of the communication lines actually go to that switch and that's where your problem is so i already know exactly what the issue is with this without even having to go any further so the next thing i'm gonna go ahead and do is essentially get this board completely out i'm gonna go ahead and flip the board upside down to where those switches are replace them and show you exactly what i replaced and stuff like that and hopefully this will help you fix yours if you have that same issue now there is other error codes that this thing had and stuff and over time if I get them I'll probably show you how to resolve some of them not all of them are fixable of course some of these have also PCH issues and stuff and that requires changing the whole CPU but we'll get into that in another video but for now we're going to fix this particular issue I was hoping to kind of show you a common issue that commonly goes bad with these boards which is the CMOS switch which goes to the data and clock line from the memory controller to the track pointer and stuff like that. Turns out it wasn't the case on this board. It actually had a completely different fault and I can tell you what the fault is. This will kind of give you a hint. I had to replace that so I put a new one on there as you can see right there. But what I originally suspected when he broke this he actually shorted it this and when it shorted it it ended up taking this fuse right here which is F15 fuse right there and it took out one of the diodes too as well so I had to replace that and that indeed did actually fix the um, memory beep issue and the reason why it does that is because when the trackpad let's just say gets no power and that's why I always say check voltages first but in this case I really didn't suspect it's so the reason why I didn't actually check it originally I suspect it was probably going to be that CMOS switch because it normally is, but in this case it wasn't even the fault. So always check voltages of course. And what happens is because that's not getting powered it actually hangs that line and think of like a CAN bus in a car for example. If one of the modules go bad it'll cause all other modules to go crazy because you know can't pick up and then it's putting noise and stuff on the communication lines and stuff well that's the same thing that happens with this when the CMOS switch goes bad because the trackpad wasn't getting power 
they couldn't detect the memory and stuff like that. It's kind of weird the way they do it, but that's how it is on this board. And of course, you can pull up the service manual and kind of see exactly how things work and stuff like that to help troubleshoot stuff. But either way it goes, I end up having placed this connected to fuse one of the diodes. That fixed that issue. Now, unfortunately, the issue didn't stop there because even though I was able to get the board to post into bias and everything like that, one thing I could not do was load an OS. And the reason why is every time I attempted to load an OS, I would get the unfortunately infamous bias ACPI error. And that's not a good error you want to see because if you get that blue screen, that normally means the GPU itself is bad. Now, I went ahead and troubleshooted the GPU. I took the heatsink off and everything, and I actually checked the MOSFET to make sh sure none of them were shorted, because if they're shorted, game over. Typically, the GPU is bad, and that's it, you know? But thankfully, that was all good. That all checked out. The issue actually turned out to be a more complex issue, and I'm not sure how this even happened. You can see there, I went ahead and changed out here, U230. And I also checked all these and stuff like that. That U230 is a dual input gate. And that actually was the fault that was causing. That was completely open. It was no good. It wasn't acting as a gate no more. And that's what caused the part in here. I printed it out to show you so you can see the part number. I couldn't even read the part number on that chip. That's how bad it was. It was blackened. So it was no good. I changed it out. And for those that want to know exactly what it is, there you go. And here you go. You can see where it is in the circuit and stuff, but either way it goes, I went ahead and replaced that, and indeed it did fix the issue, and yes, the GPU actually does work, so. Thankfully, I was able to actually repair this board, and I'm kind of glad because I paid $96 for this board, so it would have been a waste of butter. And originally when he sold it, he just said the connector. He didn't mention the other issues, but... I went ahead and fixed it because I wanted to get this board going because I wanted the one with the MX150 in it because it works with the actual analog capture card that I use when I do, you know, conversions because I actually do like Hi8, Mini DV, all the other older formats to convert over to a digital file and stuff like that. And it does not play well with the integrated, for some reason, Intel graphics card and stuff like that because it causes the audio crackle and stuff. The only time it ever works is with, for some reason, if you have an external GPU. It doesn't matter what the GPU is, so long as the NVIDIA and stuff, it works great. But if you try to do it with the integrated Intel one, it causes, for some reason, after 15 minutes of trying to capture, the audio to crackle or start cutting out and do weird stuff. I do not know why. It's always that particular hardware capture card. It's always done that no matter what, so... Yeah, I wanted to get this board going, so I'm going to get this back into the chassis and show you that it actually does work now, now that we fixed the issues. So I went ahead and fully reassembled this back into the chassis, and as you can see, this is how it goes in. Make sure, though, if you got a battery that doesn't happen to have the notch right there, that positive goes this side and negative goes on this side, because some of the newer batteries don't have that notch in there, and you can easily reverse it and then, of course, blow something on the power rail. But there you go. That's how it looks fully reassembled back in there. And that's how it would go back together. I also went ahead and actually put my modified SSD, which used to be a 4X, now to 2X, and modified that to fit in there and stuff. And that will be a whole separate video on how to do that because you got to cut some power pins and do some modifications to the SSD itself to slot it and everything. Whole separate video on its own. I do got an SSD in there too as well. And should be able to fire this up. It did have an OS on it when I was testing it for the GPU issue it had. So it's already fully loaded. And we should be able to boot in the windows and everything. So let's go ahead and power her up and see that it works. Yeah, and I do got the dual battery, so should post. Mm, there you go.
Yep, and we're in the booting screen. So I'm going to go ahead and log in, and I'll be right back once I'm done. So here you go, I have it booted all the way into Windows, and yes, the GPU does actually work, thankfully. And yeah, I did do some testing and stuff like that, that's why you see the max temperature around 92, 95. I did put a load on it, and you can see there it boosted the clock all the way up to 4.2, and of course it um, throttled down and stuff, which is what it's supposed to. These CPUs are designed for this. So I know you were saying, wow, that's hot, why would it run that hot? That's actually normal on these lab tuckers, small sheet sink and so forth. And what it does is it'll boost the clock up and as it hits the higher temperatures, then it'll kind of drop down the clock to like about 3.6 and so forth. And then of course when there's no load, it's going to drop down all the way to the lowest that it can go. But typically that's how these laptops are designed to work and stuff like that. You do definitely want to make sure you're using good dermal paste and clean the dust down stuff so it's not running those temperatures all the time. But yeah, it is normal to see. And under load, generally like red browsing or whatever, usually it gets about 60 or so. 60 to 70 at best. Only when you're really running it, then it gets up to the 95 to 97 where... You know, of course, then it throttles itself back down, but that's normal behavior. And then here, we'll go down here and we'll look at the GPU, of course, itself. And you can see there, the GPU itself kind of stayed pretty, um, you know, cool. So, yeah, she is working perfect. There is no problems. Like I said, I'm not necessarily using this thing for gaming or anything. It's actually going to be used for, I got a couple capture cards that I use with this thing because I do transfer like mini DV, high 8, digital 8 and stuff like that to digital format and stuff like that and I had to have one with the NVIDIA graphics chip in it because most of the software that I use to do it will only work with a discrete graphics card and does not like the Intel graphics card even if it's a newer laptop because I have tried it on newer and older laptops and it just does not like for some reason, and that and also FLZ2 does not like the integrator driver for that integrated graphics card, unfortunately, and stuff like this. So, with the NVIDIA ones, I never have no problem with it. It always works. And what happens is not even the video that's the problem. It's actually the audio. And, like, with this particular laptop, when I just had the regular i7 board in there with no GPU... It'll capture the video fine, but then the audio, after about 15 minutes or so, will start crackling, and then it's like a latency type thing, and then next thing you know, go out. Now, it was within sync with the video, but it just did some weird stuff to it, so that's the reason why I brought this board and paid 90 something dollars for a broken board, thankfully. Now I repaired it. It's stuff like I took a chance on it because I wanted one with the NVIDIA one, and to get the one, the MX150, for this particular model is like next to impossible unless you buy one with it fully for four or five hundred bucks that has everything in it and stuff already but trying to find a separate board for it, most people are asking like 200 bucks plus just for the board so believe it or not 90 bucks was actually a steal for this board considering it only had a couple minor issues but there you go this concludes this video for this Lenovo T480 laptop repair